Today is April the 3rd, 2024. I want to welcome all of you here to uh, Clover Hill Baptist Church in beautiful North Chesterfield, Virginia. And finally, the storm, the thunderstorm and the warning of, uh, of tornadoes and all kinds of bad weather and everything have kind of blown through. The sun was actually out when we were on our way here, and that's such a blessing. We're located at 3100 Old Courthouse Road in North Chesterfield, Virginia, directly across the street from Rockwood Park. So if you're watching online and you've never picked a particular church that you would like to fellowship with, I'd like for you to stop by and give ours a try. We've got a great fellowship here of believers in uh, the love of Jesus. And as soon as you walk in, like we did six months ago, you're going to just feel it. You'll just know. You'll just know. And it's such a blessing to have that. For all other information about our Sunday services, which are, we have a Sunday school uh, for, for adults and children at 945 Sunday mornings. And then at 11 o'clock is our regular service. And then at 5 p.m., we have an early evening service. There's a lot of people in the area that work on Sunday mornings at auto parts stores and things like that. And this way, uh, Pastor Mark Crockett has made a special service available just for you. So please stop by. For um, videos on Pastor Mark's teaching and other teachings that are on our website, it's real easy. You can just click on videos and you can pick a particular video you'd like to look at and it plays right on your computer. For those of you that are familiar with YouTube, uh, the Clover Hill Baptist Church YouTube channel is available 24 seven, as is our Facebook page which is Clover Hill Baptist Church. Our website is cloverhillbaptist.com. No church, just cloverhillbaptist.com. So those of you that are at home and are watching, thank you for tuning in, in the comfort of your own home. And for the last uh, like eight weeks, we were uh, looking into uh, the prophecies that have come true in the, in the Bible and uh, regarding the end times. And some of those appear to be happening literally as we speak. And I'm going to show you that in just, in just a few moments. But before I begin, I want to just give a, a little plug for, not really a plug, but just a little explanation of why we're here on Wednesday evenings. The purpose of the Wednesday night Bible study is to encourage all of you at home watching on Facebook and those of you who are here, of course, to read the word of God, to read the Bible, the uncompromising word of God. This is why my teaching is designed for those of you here specifically uh, that read the Bible and know most of the stories of the Bible and the teachings of the Bible to recall to your memory uh, the teachings about our Savior from both the Old Testament prophecy and imagery to the New Testament firsthand eyewitness accounts. This way you see, you get a kind of a, a big picture of how the Old Testament and the New Testament actually interlock in a cohesive message that spans actually about 1700 years of writing with 40 authors, most of whom never even met one another, which is really surprising. And they were all on the same page about Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And one of those pages that they really discuss is his kingship, that the Lord came as both a savior here on earth to die on a cross for our sins, but also to reign and rule over his creation personally. In various religions around the world, such as the Islamic religion, also known as Muslim uh, religion, or Moslem as it used to be called back in the 1940s and 50s, their religion, like Judaism and like Christianity used to be in the early church, is a theocratic religion, meaning God is the king and he is the head of both the government and 
of the people and the actual spirituality uh, of the people. We saw in last week in Zechariah chapter 14 that when the Lord returns and stands on the Mount of Olives, he destroys the 200 million man army of the Antichrist. Then he sits on the throne of David in Jerusalem and reigns and rules here on earth for a thousand years. And then all of the saints that have committed themselves to Jesus will go off to a whole new earth and a whole new heaven someplace else. The nation of Israel, the Jewish people, were originally created by God as a theocratic nation, ruled by him solely, from Abraham to Moses, until the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, our Lord was king of the Jews. But then the Jewish people went to Samuel, and you can read about it in the book of 1 Samuel, they went to the prophet and they demanded that they be ruled by a king like all the other nations on earth at the time. And thus the Jews began separating themselves from God. So in the twofold mission, so to speak, of Jesus being born as a baby and coming to earth as a human being, was to not only die on the cross for our sins and arise from the dead so that we would have the hope of everlasting life living with him forever and ever, but he would also reign and rule physically as a king once again over his own creation, us. And of course, the planet that we're living on. The Jews, I might add, even today, believe that in Zechariah 14, when our Lord returns, he will reign and rule on planet Earth forever and ever. There is no contradiction in the Bible between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So when you talk to a rabbi, a rabbi will go, so I know, I know you believe he's going to be here for just a thousand years. And they say, no, rabbi, in our book of Revelation called the Revelation of Jesus Christ given to the Apostle John to write down and publish, so to speak. After the 1000 year reign, there will be a new heaven and a new earth created and Jesus will continue to reign on a planet or an earthly like atmosphere with his people. Jews and Christians will be grafted together as one nation under God. And so usually the rabbi will say, you know, yeah, I think maybe you guys are finally getting it. You know, you're joining us. Remember, they're not joining. The Christians aren't joining the Jews. OK, I mean, excuse me, they'd rather the Jews are not joining us, the Christians. It's the other way around. The rabbis look at it that way. And by the way, that's exactly what Jesus taught. He is the vine. Okay, we are the branches and we are grafted in to that. If you want to call it a the the Lord's tree of life of people and the people that he picked by special acclamation with all the crap going on on planet Earth. He picked this group, starting with Abram, renaming him Abraham and formed the Jewish nation of Israel. So now we're going to take a look at the kingship of Jesus. But before we do, I have a six quick slides. I'm going to show you about the next three minutes of some interesting stuff that has happened just in the last 24 hours. And I think you're going to be surprised because I know that actually all of you that are here this evening went through my teaching on the checklist, you know, the prophecy checklist and what to look for. So do we have slide number one there, Ainsley? Okay, on April the 8th, we're going to have a solar eclipse. Now, these occur actually about once every 20 years. Nothing new about solar eclipses, although YouTube is filled with end of the world scenarios. In fact, I was yelling at the TV just the other night and Linda was on her computer 
uh, sending an email or something, and she said, would you please stop that? <laughs> you know, you're always yelling at the TV, but some of them were really crazy, right, honey? They were like, oh yeah, that's it, Jesus is coming, the world's coming to an end, everything's gonna be destroyed, it's Armageddon. One of them starts out, the title is, do not go outside on April the 8th, stay at home. All right, next slide, please. So this is the path uh, of the, uh... oh, there we go. There is the path. If you're at home, you can't see my laser pointer, but you'll see it on the screen. And you will notice it goes right up here through the Ohio Valley, west of right here of Virginia, the state of Virginia, where we are. We will have about 85% coverage. So 15% of the sun will be shown. So we'll have a nice corona. It's called a corona. You'll see the, the thing around it. It's actually what's interesting. It looks exactly like the lake of fire that's described in the book of Revelation where everyone who's separated from God is going to end up into. What? Don't look at it. Oh, the other thing is, yes, there are glasses that are available for $1 at your local 7-Eleven that are dark glasses. Do not use sunglasses. Don't try to look at it with a mirror or anything else or smoked glass or anything like that. This one is a pretty powerful one. And they're telling us to only buy the glasses at 7-Eleven. Uh, I think some of the drug stores are also carrying them. They're only a dollar. They're like the little cardboard 3D movie glasses. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, who can tell me what this guy is? See the red, these are red eyes right there on the bottom. And those are black wings that are folded on top. Close. Zakeda, Debbie, if I had my bell, I'd ring it. Ding, you get a gold star. That's the Zakeda invasion that's going to occur, some believe, the same time of the solar eclipse on April the 8th. Three trillion of them are coming up, all happening within the next week to 10 days. Next slide, please. Now here is the red areas are in uh, zone number one. This is, has the highest concentration of cicadas on the East Coast. And you'll see right here, it's like half of the state of Virginia and all of West Virginia. Uh, is in, uh, they have like a stage two, they're loaded with them. Yeah. Two kinds of cicadas, two kinds of cicadas yeah. that don't usually come together. Right, and they are, and they're going to mate and, and then uh, die after, what, seven to ten days or so, about two weeks, um, they're going to die. But what's interesting is the entomologists are predicting that it'll be the largest cicada invasion in 221 years since 1803 when Thomas Jefferson was president. Next slide, please. Now this, of course, is uh, Taipei, the uh, capital of Taiwan, which uh, Taiwan actually used to be called Taipei. Now it's the capital city. And they yesterday they had a 7.4 magnitude earthquake. 7.4 in the Richter scale, very strong earthquake. So far, there's about a dozen people have died and there are about 300 seriously injured and uh, hundreds others that are missing. And this building actually is not in the, uh, is, has, did not fall over, it's actually stationary in that position, all right? And I have it on the best authority that they've already leased a spot underneath it for a Starbucks. Just kidding. Is there one more slide? Ah, this happened last night in California. Of course, California has got to get in on the action, right? If there's any unusual things in the sky, there were a number of fireballs in the sky going left to right horizontally across the sky. And many have thought that there could be space junk that's falling or meteors that are falling. But the thing is, they're not falling. They're going horizontally across like this, as you see. So nobody knows what that is, but that occurred shortly after the earthquake <laughs> in Taiwan. Now, it's a Boeing 737. Oh yeah, with its doors flying off. Right, that's... It's lightning. 
you guys, finally, you guys are alive. We're finally getting a good, lively Bible study. Okay, I love it. All right. He says it's lightning. Oh, yeah? You think it's horizontal lightning? Okay. But anyway, but the, the, the fascinating thing about this is, is that all of these things all happen within 24 hours, or they're happening very, very close together. So I just want to point out that in the end times, that is the prediction that Jesus made, that when you see these signs coming as birthing pains or as labor pains, closer and closer together and increasing in intensity, then you know uh, that your salvation is near. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ainsley. You can... Okay, that last slide we're going to show in about 20 minutes. Okay, number seven. Thank you. In Isaiah 9, 6, Isaiah prophesied, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. Isaiah predicted that the Lord was going to return as a mighty God, heavenly father, prince of peace, and a king that's going to sit on the throne of David. Matthew chapter 1, 20, 26, we have... Uh, the angel Gabriel, and he's coming to Joseph in a dream. And this is what verses 20 to 26 say. But while he thought on these things, that's Joseph, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And as we discussed uh, a few weeks ago, Jesus, Yoshua, Yoshu, Yah, is salvation, God's salvation, or salvation is of God. That's Jesus' name. So his name himself says that he's here for the salvation of our sins. Now, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which may be interpreted as God with us. So literally God in the form of a human being, Jesus, was walking the streets of Nazareth and later the streets of Jerusalem as God, because he is God. Now, what's fascinating is and this is a mistake that are a lot of Bible trivia uh, books. And there's some really good Bible trivia uh, games, so to speak, on YouTube, a video where you can watch and then you, they'll ask you a question and then they give you a few seconds. And you see if you got the answer correct. And one of them is here that that comes up all the time is why was Mary or Joseph told to call his name Jesus when it, when they're also told to call his name Emmanuel? It didn't. The angel Gabriel said they the people will refer to him as God walking among us. They will call him Emmanuel. So if you get a chance, take a look at that in Matthew. It's also in the Gospel of Luke. Now we have the story, of course, of the wise men from the east coming to Herod. Jesus is now born. And in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Two things, king of the Jews, and he's God because 
as you know, the first four commandments are about God. The second six are about our relationship with the Lord. Okay, our spiritual relationship. And number one and number two is specifically, he is the Lord your God, period. You don't worship any other. You don't make a statue or an image of any other. You don't pray to it. You don't worship to it. And you don't even bow to it. And there are religions, Orthodox religions, we call them. There's Eastern Orthodox religions, a Russian Orthodox church. And they say, well, we don't worship this particular person who died hundreds or thousands of years ago. Uh, we just venerate them. We light candles in front of their icon or their picture and we bow to them. I said, well, right there, you're breaking the second commandment. You're not even to bow to them. Now, when Herod heard these things from the wise men, I know you, you remember this. This is one of my favorite scenes. I wish they'd put this in a movie. Herod starts to come unglued, and we're going to see why. He was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where the Christ, the Messiah, the King, should be born. Because, as you see... King Herod was the king of the Jews. The Roman emperor Caesar Augustus gave him that official title. He married a Hasmonean princess and uh, they made him king over all of Judea. And as a result of that, his title, official title was king of the Jews. And so he's sweating bullets. Who is this king of the Jews? And they're coming to worship him. Why aren't they worshiping me? They worship Caesar Augustus in Rome. They should be worshiping me. I'm king of the Jews. In the Palm Sunday prophecy, Zechariah 9.9, 9, Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Your king is coming to you. He is just, and listen to this, He's having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass, a mule. Some say a donkey, but that's interesting. We talked about this last week. The Hebrew word for donkey and mule are actually the same word. So it can be either either or. What's interesting about this, this uh, prophecy the angel Gabriel, as we looked at last week, in Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 to 27, made the same prediction and actually gave us the date of March the 30th, 33 AD. So what's fascinating here in Zechariah's prediction is that he's not just coming as a king, but he's also coming for the salvation of our sins. It's fascinating. Now, I guess a bunch of the Jews, including most of the disciples of Jesus, especially Peter and Barnabas, who both carried swords, they were referred to as zealots. They wanted the Lord to return and overthrow the Roman Empire and establish Israel as the nation ruling the planet. Those were the zealots at the time. Unfortunately for them, it didn't happen. But they learned why when the Holy Spirit, I'm sure, came upon them on that first day of Pentecost, that he came not just as a king, but as Zechariah says in his prophecy, he came also for salvation. Now, in John chapter 2, and also in Matthew chapter 21, we see two cleansings of the temple. And this is when Jesus began his ministry in John chapter two. It's actually the first public event that he did after he changed the water into wine at the, uh, the Feast of Canaan. But he said something really fascinating in John beginning with two, beginning with verse 13. And the Jews Passover was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting there 
And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen, poured out the money changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence and make not my father's house a house of merchandise. That was at the beginning of his three and a half year public ministry as Many uh, Bible commentators and interpreters refer to it as his public ministry. But near the end of his life, literally right after Palm Sunday, probably the next day on Monday, he goes into the temple again three and a half years later. And Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verse 12, tells us what happened the second time. He cleansed the temple and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the money changers tables. And he said unto them, it is written, my house is shall be called the house of prayer and ye have made it a den of thieves wait a second three and a half years ago he said my father's house okay you're making my father's house a house of merchandise and three and a half years years later whose house is the temple my house okay shall be called a house of prayer. Jesus just identified himself publicly right there as God and the coming Messiah. Matthew 27, Jesus appears in front of Pontius Pilate before his crucifixion. He's being questioned by the governor of Judea. And Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him saying, art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, you said it, brother. Actually, the Bible says, thou sayest, but it be the same thing. You said it, I am. So now when Jesus is crucified, one of the reasons, or actually probably the prominent reason that Jesus was crucified by the Romans was that he, he, he found no guilt in Jesus, as you know, is an innocent man. He actually performed uh, a kind of a, a Saturday Night Live ritual in front of the Jews, literally slapping them in the face. When he was talking to Jesus in Matthew chapter 27, Jesus, he knows is Jewish. He knows that the chief priests came to him saying that we want this man crucified because he said all kinds of nasty things and everything. But he also knew the Jewish customs. And so right in front of the Jewish high priests and the crowd, what does he do? He ceremoniously washes his hands in a golden bowl of labor, it's called, right in front of them and says that I wash my hands of the, the sin of this man because I find him totally innocent. I find no guilt in this man. So then the high priests, as you remember, go to him and say, you know, you're going to be in trouble with Caesar. And he goes, why? He goes, you report to Caesar, do you not? He says, yes. Well, this man called himself a king, and he's going to try to overthrow your throne here in Judea as the governor of Judea. That's called sedition. Uh-oh, his ears perked up. He's got to now punish him. And he knows that Jesus is not, he's thinking, okay, he's not a Roman citizen, so I don't have to send him to Rome for, to, for trial. I can crucify him right here. And so they said, if you don't do it, we're going to write a letter to Caesar and we're going to tell him that you refuse to execute a criminal that is trying to overthrow Rome. So he was forced. And as you know, too, in the Gospel of John, you also read Portula. Claudia Portula. How many people know who Claudia Portula was at the time? Anybody remember? No, no. 
That's right, his wife. And she had a dream, and she says, please, don't have anything to do with this man. You know? And he did, and he crucified Jesus, and above Jesus' head, right on his crossbeam, they attached a sign. Could you put up the sign for me there? Ainsley, if you get a chance, put up the uh, number seven. And he puts a sign up above. And there it is. Can you all read that? It's in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Now, this is kind of a modern idea of what the sign looked like. But the Romans were very in, into themselves. First of all, it would have begun in Latin. Then Greek and Hebrew would have been at the bottom. But the people that did this decided to put Hebrew up here, the Greek. And then here you have Jesus Nazarenus Rex Udiorum. Um, the Nazarenus means uh, a Nazarene, but it could also read Jesus Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And he puts it up there in all three languages so everybody would read it. The legal, the legalese, he has to put it up because the Romans, I'm not kidding, I didn't live 2,000 years ago, but if I did, I'd almost bet you a dollar, Dan, that Rome wasn't really run by Caesar, it was run by a pack of lawyers. Because everything they did, their I's were dotted, their T's were crossed, right? Their, their Yodas and their, and their Tau's in Greek were crossed. And of course, no punctuation in Greek and very little in Latin, but still, they gotta put that up there in Latin. If that's the legalese. That's the reason we're crucifying him because he claimed to be king of the Jews. And then they put it up for everybody else to read in their own language. Greek, of course, the language of the Roman Empire, everybody spoke it. And then Hebrew for the Orthodox Jews. Well, what happened was, <laughs> uh, as you know, the high priest, Annas and Caiaphas were outraged again. Here we go. They're outraged again. And they go to him and they say, what? You put a sign up over this man, Jesus. Thank you, by the way, for crucifying him. But you got to take the sign down. He's not the king of the Jews. He only claimed to be the king of the Jews. He's not really the king of the Jews. And of course, I always look at in my own kind of like warped comic mind, my animated mind. That Pontius Pilate is played by Yule Brenner. And I just saw him, by the way, a couple of nights ago in the Ten Commandments. You know, let it be written, let it be done. Remember the Ten Commandments. He did the same thing, by the way, in The King and I with Deborah Carr. He said, let it be written, let it be done. And that's what Pontius Pilate did. Right here, John chapter 19, verse 23. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Now get out of my face, you two. And then off they, they sulk away. After Jesus died on the cross, he rose from the dead, ascended into heaven. And Deacon Dan is going to love this. One of Dan's fellow deacons, Stephen, was appointed with seven other young men to wait on tables for the early church. So that Peter, John, and the other um, disciples of Jesus could go out and preach the word of God, beginning in Jerusalem, as Jesus said, and then throughout all of Asia and the whole rest of the world. Well, something got a burr under his saddle, and he started preaching in the temple himself. And they arrested him, and he continued right in front of the Sanhedrin, the 70-member body of the uh, We'll call it the, uh, the Jewish Congress. The Jews had a, um, a form of government that, in a sense, was theocratic, but they really didn't consult God for permission to do anything. There were no prophets anymore. 
There was no Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. So I don't know what they did on um, the Day of Atonement when the high priest was supposed to go in and speak to God inside the Holy of Holies in the temple. That's that 30 foot by 30 foot by 30 foot high room, totally coated in gold, right? The gold floor, the gold walls, the gold ceiling. So when the Shekinah glory of God appeared over the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, the whole place lit up really big time. So they didn't have that anymore, but they still had 70 wise men, so to speak, that governed the Jews. They were a combination of a governing body, a religious body, and a Supreme Court, the last place you could go to be judged for a crime. Well, Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7 is one that I highly recommend that you read one of these evenings. It is glorious. Acts chapter 7. And he basically goes through the history of the Jews, literally starting with Adam and Eve, going through uh, Noah, Moses, the kings. He tells them that you killed all of the uh, all of the prophets of God. And he says to them, you're the leaders of the Jews. You killed them. And then he ends with, he says, you're also now the murderers of the just one. They just, he accuses them of killing Jesus, the Messiah. The just one actually is referred to in Isaiah, uh, the prophecy of Isaiah, where he talks about that he's going to bring justice as well as salvation. He is the just one, the Messiah. So they rip their clothes. They run at him headlong, drag him outside the main city gate, and they stone him to death for what he said. But that was, that was as I like to say, um, at the time of Jesus, that was the last public declaration of Jesus being known as King of the Jews. Now we have the epistles of the Apostle Paul. And I've told you this before, when I was in the seminary many, many years ago in a galaxy far, far away, I, uh, I read in the epistles that Paul kept referring to Jesus as Christ Jesus. And I went to one of my instructors, Father Tarog, and I said, Father Tarog, I said, there's something wrong here, it's Jesus Christ, right? And he says, uh, yeah, he says, I don't know. He says, I find that, Paul is, he keeps putting it backwards. He says, maybe it's just a translation. And I, I said, okay. So I started looking at other translations. And then when my roommate, Joe Foley, and I got into our Greek class, we started looking it up in Greek. And guess what? Okay. He referred to in all of his Greek writing as Christ Jesus. Now, the word Christ we, we'll just take a look at the English, Christ Jesus. The word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos. And that's where we get the English word Christ from. It is a title given to an anointed king, a messiah, a leader of a country or a group of people. So the anointed one, Messiah, the transliteration from the Hebrew word Mashiach means the anointed one or the anointed king. And the Greek equivalent is Christos, which we get the English word Christ from. So in his accurate writing, the Apostle Paul actually got it right. <laughs> and me, I was a confused 19 year old kid uh, in the seminary. And I couldn't figure it out then, but it took me a few years afterwards that Paul was dead accurate. He was referring to Jesus as the king, the coming king, and that's who he was preaching, was King Jesus, the Messiah. So now, wrapping this up, you've seen beginning in the Old Testament, and now in the New Testament, the kingship of Jesus referred to multiple times. Um, he came to us in a dual role 
as the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Zechariah in 9.9 referred to, that Jesus came as a king, but he also came for salvation. And as we saw in Zechariah 14, that when he comes back, he's coming back as a king and a ruler. Now, next week, when we wrap up the, um, the kingship of Jesus, we're going to also look at two particular things. One is that when he comes back, he is coming back to reign and rule with a rod of iron. And we're going to look at that, what it means. We're going to see one quote right here that it's all about Jesus and it's about him and that even our salvation and everything, the wonderful gift that he's given us to free us from our our sins that we've committed personally against God, but also free us from the, the great sin, so to speak, of the world, the sin of, of Adam, which we refer to as original sin, that he is going to now give planet Earth one last chance at salvation. And then he's going to reign and rule as a benevolent king over those who love him. And he's going to show us how much love that he's had for us since the creation, since before time even began, he loved us and knew who we were. Isaiah says that one of my favorites, he says, you saw me in my mother's womb before I was even created. <laughs> you know, he could see that, you see that was happening. So here in Zechariah 14, beginning with verse 16, now, this is right after he kills the 200 million man army. Remember Zechariah. It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And we're going to talk about this in just a second. And it shall come to be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them there shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt not go up and come not, that they have no rain. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that shall not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is first mentioned in Deuteronomy 16, 16. Three times a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose in the Feast of Unleavened Bread and in the Feast of Weeks and in the Feast of Tabernacles and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Okay. It's also mentioned in Leviticus. And this came up at the end of our, uh, my teaching last week. That uh, one august member who will remain nameless. <laughs> mentioned to me about the Feast, of Levit the Feast of Leviticus. And it being in uh, the Old Testament as being mandated for the Jews to remember that our Lord took them out of Egypt and they had to live in tents. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. But this group of uh, people are not Jews, not all of them. These people are the people of the nations that came up against the Lord. They were on the side of the Antichrist. They were not in the 200 million man army, but they were left over. We're going to see people that are left over that are not Jewish and they're not saved. And that's why we have the 1000 year reign of the Lord here on earth. It's for their salvation, because at the end of it, in the book of Revelation, we see that Satan is led out of the abyss along with his demons. And he gathers together this group of people that still are not saved, that will not honor uh, Jesus as our Lord and Savior and King. And they will try again to go to war uh, against the Lord. 
And of course, they're all thrown into the lake of fire. And then, as the Apostle John tells us, the tabernacle of the Lord, the new Jerusalem, comes down out of heaven. We're all picked up and we go off to a new planet and a new heaven someplace else. But I want to point out something about feasts in general. They're all about Jesus. They're not about us. The, uh, the first time I read the 23rd Psalm, I realized that. Because it all starts out that it's about you. You know? That he, uh, he leads me to green pastures. He leads me by the still waters. Right? The other thing is, is he leads me on the path of righteousness, but not for me. For his namesake, right? For the Lord's namesake. I want everyone to remember when they were in tents, where were the tents pitched when they were in the desert? Do you remember how they were pitched? They were pitched in a circle all around 360 degrees around the tent of meeting, which was in the middle, the tabernacle where they had the Ark of the Covenant. That's where the Lord's presence was. The Lord was with them and led them through the desert with a column of smoke by day and a column of fire by night. All of these feasts, sacrifices, and the like are all about Jesus. They're not about us. The Ten Commandments, we talked about that. The Apostle Paul goes on and tells us that the Ten Commandments are a model for us to follow, to look at how sinful we are. And Jesus himself and the Apostle Paul and Peter say that there's no way we can even keep all 613 <laughs> laws, Jewish laws, that the, uh, the Jewish leadership had come up with after the basic law of Moses, as dictated uh, to Moses by the Lord. So when Jesus is now leading us on planet Earth for a thousand years, we have a, this homogeneous group of unbelievers, we have a remnant of Jews, and we have people that actually were rooting for the Antichrist to win. And they somehow were left behind. But the Lord deals with them, and that's why he's so strong with them. Now, this then group has a new Feast of Tabernacles, reminding them, I don't know if they're going to be living in tents or not, but it's reminding them that he is now living among them. He is now Emmanuel. He is God with them, and he's not going to leave them. And he's given them one last break. This is your last chance, everybody. Okay? Take advantage of it. But if you don't, when, it, when the thousand-year reign is over with, I'm out of here. And uh, that's going to be cold and hard on some people's ears. But we're going to see next week why he is, he's doing this. And why he's going to be, as it says in... Um, Revelation chapter 12, that he is going to be reigning. This child that was born of the Virgin Mary is going to come back to reign and rule with a rod of iron. Lastly, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, even in the Old Testament, even at the time of when they were in the desert, there were no particular restrictions uh, put on the participation in the Feast of Tabernacles, but it's a feast of sheer joy. It's the ultimate Israelite holiday. In fact, the Jews even today refer to it as the holiday. They just call it the holiday, which is, Linda and I have one of our favorite pictures called the holiday. Uh, one of the few Christmas oriented pictures uh, not done by the uh, Hallmark card people. That at Christmas time, you see all these Hallmark movies, they're all alike. The script is exactly the same in every one of them. Okay? You know, I love those, right? The Jews 
celebrate the Lord bringing them out of, uh, out of Egypt in the desert for 40 years. And for a thousand years, they're going to celebrate basically the same thing, that the Lord is with them and guiding them in person. So it's a, both a feast of, a, of an in-person celebration of what God did for them when they were in the desert by being with them personally and guiding them for the 40 years. But then it's going to be a future 1,000 year event as well. Using the words of uh, our senior pastor, Mark Crockett, in conclusion, um, as many of you know, I know Dan is, we're a little bit alike in, in this way. I could, I could uh, keep talking about the Lord and the Bible and, and everything till the, the, uh, the cow, cow, cows come home, right? And uh, Jim, this is why I like uh, Jim, Dan, and, uh, and especially Gene, is I love you guys because I love to reason together with you. You know what I mean? I love, because you know what that shows me? It shows how much you guys love the Lord. And you're interested in reading the Bible and you're looking stuff up and you're saying, wow, yeah, that's in there. Yeah, I caught that, you know, and so forth. Yes, Jean. Um, where did you say the Lord started his ministry? Oh, OK. Jean just asked where did the Lord start the ministry. And I'm going to answer that right after I do the benediction because we have to go offline. Uh, but he started it in in. Cana is the first place that it's mentioned that he appeared publicly and that's up in that's up in the Sea of Galilee area. I thought his first ministry was when he was twelve years old and he went into the Oh yeah, he was in the temple talking to them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. If you want to if you want to make that as part of his public ministry, yes. He was in there reasoning with them. And they were so surprised that he had so much knowledge about the, uh, the Bible, the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Yeah, that's, you're absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. For those of you at home, thank you for watching this evening. You've been watching, uh, as many of you know, Clover Hill Baptist Church here in North Chesterfield, not Midlothian, Virginia. And I wanna thank you for joining us. In the meantime, you can email us your prayer requests or your Bible questions, which I will pass on to uh, Deacon Dan at my earliest moment. Just kidding, Dan. Info at CloverHillBaptist.com. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Good night, everyone. <laughs>